to you. This is Caroline, or I guess technically pronounced Carolyn. The end goal with this is to create a low-cost robot arm that I can eventually use to swing my camera around here in the studio. This smaller and, you know, slightly decorated version is one of the many, many milestones on the way there. It's also been a great chance for me to experiment for solving, you know, many of the problems that come up. That's, that's, that's smoke. And in doing so, I've learned a lot and many of the things that I've tried could also be very useful in that little niche of 3D printing that I usually make videos about. This obviously also is very much 3D printed. So in this video, I wanna show you the build process of getting here and you know some of the creative solutions that I came up with. And to start, we need to go back to a bit over a month ago. This project is sponsored by Voxel PLA and the build starts on June 16th. This project had a deadline and that was open source 2025. They asked me, hey, do you want to show anything off? And I was like, yeah, I, I could build this in time. And I did make that, even if just barely. Now, in this robot platform, Carolyn is inspired by Portal 2's GLaDOS, obviously. And in the original, it looks like GLaDOS has a steward platform for a head. And while that is an unconventional choice to put on the end of a robot arm, it is one that sort of makes sense. It provides full six degrees of freedom and has relatively simple kinematics to solve. Plus, of course, it just looks really cool. A steward platform consists of six actors and six links. In this case, I'm using these double ball joint links that have a printed insert to get them to a consistent length. And for motion, I'm using these servos from Waveshare. Now, they might look like a standard RC car servo, but they have a fully digital interface and you can just daisy chain these. These have a magnetic encoder, so they give you position feedback. And from what I'm reading about these, these could actually be really cool options for just using a completely 360 degree rotational motion without having to deal with the jitteriness and lack of feedback from a traditional servo. Also, these have like three Newton meters, so they're pretty dang powerful. This, and that's gonna go like that, and then these go in here. There you go, first link. Ah, it looks like it's gonna work. Now, we'll come back to these servos later, but in order to finally attach them, I have to build the rest of the robot first. And while most of the functionality of Carolyn is using 3D printed parts quite extensively, there are still some components that you shouldn't make out of plastic, and that is the actual structural members of the arms themselves. For these, I'm using plain aluminum square or rectangular tubing. The entirety of the aluminum tubing I'm using for this project cost me like 20 bucks. And not only is it really cheap, it is also for our intents and purposes, pretty much perfectly flat and straight. And because it is hollow tubing where all of the material is on the outside on the shell, like in a 3D print, it is pound for pound some of the most rigid material you can use for this application. Tapping and threading into a two millimeter wall thickness piece of aluminum isn't the most reliable thing. So some of these screws are just gonna be in there for decoration. You know what? I'll keep these in there with a generous amount of thread lock and uh, yeah, we'll just keep this between you and me, right? There we go. So this piece is gonna be Carolyn's frontmost joint arm thing. And with that completely built, there's no reason to attach this to a platform, the servos at this point, but I just really wanna see how it looks. Threading these ball heads half a turn at a time was pretty tedious, but once they're in, they're in. This is one of those situations where a printed thread is totally fine. They will only be tightened once, don't see a ton of external load, and the thread from the ball head goes in pretty far, so you get a ton of thread engagement. And just moving this to a platform around by hand, it does look like the motion is working as intended. Just for completeness, I'm also going to attach the shroud for the eye and the head. Now, these are purely for decoration, so my priority for mounting these was not getting the most strength, but just staying light as much as possible. Yeah, holy cow, like this is, this is actually looking so much better than I thought it would. Like this entire thing really ties it together. I should have started with the other end because now this is sort of unwieldy to hold, but uh, I just wanted to see this face. I've not seen this face in so long. It's so good. Now, I am getting better at cutting these threads and not just immediately stripping them out. But honestly, between the press fit of the printed part on the aluminum and just tons and tons of M3 screws holding these parts in, I don't think this is going anywhere. 
For allowing joint motion between each of the segments, I'm using these thin ring ball bearings. These are a lot larger than they need to be for the forces that they will be seeing. But because they are so large, they will actually spread those forces over a larger area of the printed part, and that makes for a rigid joint, even though the base plastic itself isn't all that rigid. This connection right here unfortunately needed to be multiple printed parts because it needs to clamp over the previous joint from both sides. So this connection I tried to make as rigid as possible by adding pins and by using the largest screws I could fit. What I'm not showing you much of in this video is the design process and CAD. At some point pretty early on I realized that optimizing all these parts for printability just wasn't going to happen in the time that I had. So almost every single PTG part was printed with gratuitous amounts of PLA supports or vice versa. The absolute MVPs here were the Prusa XL that can do that efficiently without wasting a ton of material on purging. And the filaments from today's sponsor, Vox the PLA. I was using some of the lower quality profiles on the XL to save printing time and a high flow nozzle running right at its limit. And still, I've not had a single part fail. These parts are always using Voxel PLA's high speed capable PLA Plus and PTG Plus filaments in white, black, and gray. And they're just $16.99 for a full one kilogram spool, plus bulk discounts and free shipping over $75 in the US. This project would not have been possible if I was having to restart 20 hour prints, but the Voxel PLA filaments did their job extremely well. They've got new colors coming out real soon and you can check them out at voxelpla.com. I think I'll be using a lot more of the dual material supports in the future. Getting that design freedom and then just peeling off the supports is just so liberating when you're used to being constrained to really strict overhang and bridging limits. What I really like about this robot arm is that the first and second joints are pretty much identical. They use the same design, the same printed parts, they are assembled the exact same way. The only thing that changes is that they are flipped 180 degrees relative to each other because they move in opposite directions. That makes the entire thing cheaper to source and easier to build. And at this point, I could use all the help I could get. Today is July 3rd. In less than a week, I'll be on a plane to California. So I need to get this built before then. And at this point, I need some parts from this old robot to make this new one function. So I'm gonna need to tear this apart. I still need to do like inverse kinematics and software. And this head is a bit more complex than I thought it was gonna be. I'm a bit stressed out right now. <laughs> the part I need the most right now is the base bearing. And this is a crucial part in any arm style robot. Every other part of the robot rests on this bearing. So not only does it see the highest forces, because when the arm is fully extended, there is a huge lever pulling on this bearing. But that lever also means that any slight amount of slop that we see here will make the head itself less rigid too. So I built my own. I turned what is essentially an outer bearing race from a scrap piece of aluminum and then printed two bearing halves for the inner race that I could pre-tension against each other, essentially creating a zero tolerance bearing. Each of the halves has five standard skateboard bearings in there and these are pinned to the printed part and then the alignment and pre-tension can be adjusted with the screws connecting both parts and sandwiching the outer aluminum bearing race. Using 3D printed parts for everything here means that the assembly is pretty straightforward because you can just add features wherever I want, but it also means that the parts don't have the tightest tolerances. The adjustment here helps, but it does get quite finicky when you have to adjust 10 screws that are angled against each other. Eventually I did get it done, but I think for a future iteration I wouldn't use this type of bearing again. This right here is going to be the motor mount for this base axis. Motor goes here, sticks out, and there's some adjustability going on there. I thought I had all the CNC kitchen inserts, but the largest ones I have is M5, and this is designed for M6. This is one of those situations where if you know the rules, you can bend the rules. Typically, I wouldn't really want to use these rivnuts nuts uh, as a threaded insert. These are the only ones that kind of fit. But in this situation, because we're not seeing any forces that would pull them out, and because this flange that they have actually supports the motor mount, these are actually perfectly fine. That actually looks pretty good. But yeah, I know it's not what you came here for. You came here for a nine axis robot arm. So let's actually get this thing moving. The base bearing is the first rotational axis and it gets directly attached to the second rotational axis through it, an adapter piece that I didn't really have time to design well, so it's, it's a bit tight. And at this point you can already see how the entire motion is going to function. Upside down, of course. 
The main design goal for Carolyn was avoiding the need for large and expensive joint motors. Typically you'll see those matched with complex gearboxes like a harmonic drive or a cyclo gearing or some other type of gearing that either introduces some elasticity or backlash to the system. I didn't want none of that, so I'm building what is essentially half of a scissor lift. I think that mechanism makes so much sense here, because we are using the rigidity that we already need for the arms to not flex, but also we get a huge leverage advantage because we're not just driving each arm right at the joint. And that didn't do it for this one, because I just used components I already had at hand, but if you use something like a pre-tensioned lead screw nut or a ball screw, then you get a mechanism that has practically no backlash at all. I did make one mistake with the design though, and that is these connecting links. Yeah, they shouldn't bounce like that. The pink prototype just had straight links going from point A to B in a straight line. These have this fancy 3D curve shape because it needs to bend around certain features. I should have just given them a little more space and made them straight, but as a quick fix, I just reprinted them from a carbon fiber PTG. Not stronger, but it is more rigid, and that seemed to make it usable at least. Okay, so uh, my plane's leaving tomorrow, and uh, I, I guess this is gonna have to be good enough. Uh, I need to get this thing packaged up, and I can figure out soft and all that on the road somehow, right? I'm back. I'm still impressed by how well this thing fit in my suitcase with just taking the head off. What I was showing off at Open Source really was just an absolute minimum version of what Caroline can do. And since I've gotten back, I've finished the inverse kinematics, which I unnecessarily did completely from scratch. Up until this point, all the movement had only been save the position of each of the actors then play back a list of those positions and smoothly interpolate between them. Keyframe animation, basically. To save a new keyframe, I can easily enough set the servos in the head to output zero torque, and then I can just move them into position by hand. But for the base axes, I do have to jog those into position. And then when playing back, each axis just moves from its start position to the end position on its own accord, basically. Now with IK, I can tell it, or her, to move the head to any specific position in space, while also facing the steward platform towards a specific point in space. I can leave that focus point fixed and only change the head position, and we get a perfectly tracked slider move. Or if I just change the focus point, it's a basic tripod style pan and tilt with the servos doing all the work. Because I have full control over how this motion is generated with my own IK solver, how exactly these moves look and play out is completely open. For example, what I want to implement next are sort of orbit style shots, where instead of moving like a slider on a straight line, uh, the head keeps a constant distance from the subject and simulates sort of a sphere move. I think that could look really cool. Also, right now I'm actually already using a video game style acceleration curve called Smoother Step, but I can change that to include, for example, some style of input shaping as well. How I'm currently doing this is that I'm dividing the entire move I want to do into 20 segments per second, and then streaming those segments with the appropriate acceleration and speed limits to the hardware. So the servos in the head handle that directly. Each one of them has its own sort of motion controller that you can talk to over Serial and the three stepper base axes, well, they, they think they're a 3D printer. I don't know what you expected from me. I see stepper motors, I use a 3D printer mainboard. In this case, a uh, do it to Wi-Fi, which is actually pretty useful. Um, the RepRap firmware has a constant move time mode where you just tell it, here's the line of G-code that I want you to run. Uh, 
do what you can to finish it in, let's say, 50 milliseconds. It also does move chaining, where it doesn't completely come to a full stop between each of these segments. Also, that's, that's not how that's supposed to run. But in order for that to work, it needs to keep a certain amount of moves buffered while the servos will start that new move right away. So as a workaround, I'm just delaying the servos by four segments. That's, that's, that's smoke. Supposedly the Waveshare servos have overcurrent and over temperature safeties built in, but I'm not so sure about how well they actually work. Well, I think the term we're looking for here is uh, completely f and we're back in business. I had bought a spare just to be sure. Running on their own, they look pretty great, but with the amount of friction that they have internally and with a camera hanging off the front, they will often fall into a sort of stick-slip rhythm when you want them to move just a little more slowly. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I now know how to solve better, but honestly, I'm still really proud of what I built here. The base concept of using these scissor lift axes works really well, and it absolutely does make for a much more rigid kinematic setup than, you know, using those super high geared stepper motors right at the joints where they see the full leverage and have insane torque requirements. This does have the downside of a slightly limited useful range of motion, but any kind of robot setup has sort of a preferred motion range. Plus, this will eventually be on a track on the ceiling, so range of motion isn't going to be a huge issue anyway. So far, total cost in material for all of this, if I were to buy all the parts that I needed, are about 500 euros on the dot, with the servos and the ball links for the head making up almost half of that already. So maybe if it's just about running a camera, a classic gimbal style head would be a better option overall. But I think I'll replace this hardware anyway with this. You know, steppers are something that I know how to use to get the robot base running, but they're pretty noisy and they skip steps way too easily, especially if you run them fast. So I've been having to run them super slowly. Brushless DC motors with the simple Fox software to turn them into servos look like a much more robust solution overall. You know, they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, and they rip pretty hard. You know, let me... Yeah, these have a ton of torque. So these also could run a 3D printer and they never lose steps. So future experiment, maybe? Let me know what you want to see next with this project. Should I try out how useful this arm will be with different kinds of heads, arms, hands, I guess, uh, like with a gripper that can unload 3D printer beds? Or do you want to see more of a technical deep dive on this setup and on the engineering decisions I had to make when designing it? Leave me a comment below. In any case, thank you for watching, keep on making, and I'll see you in the next one.